Good evening. I'm Jeremy Hobson, although that uh, thing just said that it was me, but actually it's me. Uh, before we get started tonight, I want to tell you three things, one of which is that you can check out the full City Space lineup for other events at wbur.org slash events. Uh, we're going to be taking questions after uh, the conversation tonight, and a staff member is going to bring around one of these microphones if you would like to ask one. And Adam's book is also going to be available for sale in the lobby after the program. Um, so as many of you may know, I host the show here and now uh, from 12 to 2. Uh, weekdays uh, here on WBUR and around the country. Um, but before that, I was the host of the Marketplace Morning Report. Uh, and before that was a reporter for Marketplace, first based in Washington and then uh, covering Wall Street. And I started that gig one week before Lehman Brothers collapsed. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I learned in um, doing that kind of economic reporting, especially as somebody who didn't have a background in that, is that Economic business news is very important. Very few people really understand it or care to understand it, and it matters for all of us. And I think we all learned during the financial crisis how much that is true. Um, one of the giants of this field of economic and business reporting is here with us tonight, uh, and that is Adam Davidson, who also spent time at Marketplace and NPR, where he co-founded the groundbreaking Planet Money podcast, which I'm sure many of you have heard. Um, before, of course, he was stolen away by the New York Times Magazine and then The New Yorker. Uh, but now he has moved into the world of being an author with his book, The Passion Economy. Uh, and so it is my pleasure to welcome to City Space, Adam Davidson. Thank you. So Adam, as we sit here tonight, um, the stock market is uh, at a record high or near a record high as it has been uh, many days recently. Unemployment is near a record low. Uh, and yet there's a lot of concerns about the state of the economy from many places. What, what, how would you assess, uh, given your background, how would you assess where we are right now in this US economy? I was going to make a joke about the visionary leadership of our <laughs> president, but I can't even make that joke, so I'm not going to make that joke. Um, I mean, we are in beyond uncharted territory. It's hard. You know, I feel like the secret that we learned at Planet Money um, is that so much economic and business reporting just lacks narrative that there's, you know, you read... Um, the daily news about the, the economy, and there's not a big sweeping narrative that you can put your head in. And just the discipline of trying to tell a narrative about the financial crisis or what's going on in the stock market or whatever um, is incredibly powerful at helping people understand what's going on. I mean, that's sort of the goal of this book. And I would say this current economy, we don't quite have our head around. I mean, we're wildly overdue for some kind of cyclical event. Um, we're still, in a sense, on the life support that the Fed and other central banks put the global economy on in, in the wake of the financial crisis. Um, we're, uh, but we are, there are things happening that are both you would think would be extremely problematic, you know, nonsensical trade wars and um, sort of what economists call policy uncertainty, you know, having a decision-making process that is hard to track. I do think Wall Street really likes divided government because they basically prefer nothing to happen. Um, do you think that anybody understands the economy that we're in right now? No, I don't think they do. I don't think it can be understood. Um, I do want to say, I hope, this is obvious that the Wall Street Wall Street is not a stand-in for the economy. Wall Street is sometimes there are periods where Wall Street seems to grow alongside general growth that benefits everyone, and there are times when the opposite is the case. And there's certainly things that happened under the previous Congress, the tax bill and a general chaotic but 
pro-business slant. You know, people wonder, why does Mitch McConnell put up with this guy that he clearly hates? Well, he's getting every single thing he wants. He's got... And so one part of the explanation is we do have a one-time transfer of wealth from poorer people to richer people and richer people and, and you know, benefiting large companies. So that is a reason why the stock market might go up that isn't something to be celebrated. Um, and, uh, but, but then as you say, unemployment's very low. Um, so yeah, so it, it, um, uh, I guess I could just talk for 20 minutes about how we don't know, but this is a very confusing economy. Well, but in, in your book, one of the things that you say is, is basically we're operating with the rules of the old economy um, and that this new economy has different rules. So what you, you, you think that you know what the new economy's rules are. What, what are they? What, what is the new economy? Yeah. I, so the idea of this book came about as I, so I've spent the last, 20 years or so, mostly covering scary stuff, bad stuff connected to the economy. Um, I covered the war in Iraq, weirdly for marketplace, uh, you know, as from a, Baghdad, from Baghdad as a, and, and covered the Middle East generally. Um, I came back and then, you know, a few years later covered the financial crisis. Uh, and then at, after, after the financial crisis, and then there's the European crisis, um, linked but slightly different. You know, I think throughout the world we started understanding trends that had existed forever: this ec rising economic inequality, um, and uh, and then more recently, for the last few years, my job at the New Yorker has mostly been covering Trump and his business practices, which are not good, and. Um, and so, um, so much of my work has been kind of depressing stuff. And along the way, I would meet people who had a story to tell that was actually optimistic and mm -hmm. exciting. And it, at first, it was just something I noted. I remember at, at Planet Money, I did a couple stories. When I wrote for the New York Times Magazine, I, I did a couple columns. But eventually, I started to think there's a theory here. There's an actual, there's something going on that is alongside the bad stuff, there's something good. And it was actually Scott Stern, who's sitting right there. Um, From MIT. The MIT uh, Business School professor. I remember calling, I can't remember who I called, but I called somebody. Here's a weird thing. You would think you call business school professors and say, hey, how does the average person, the average business, the average employee, what should they do? How should they succeed? And what they will tell you is, we have no idea. We've never thought about it. We're not interested. <laughs> and I, was, I made that call many times. And then someone said, oh, wait, there is this one guy who is interested in that. And it was Scott Stern. And, and um, I started talking to Scott. I started coming to Boston um, or to Cambridge to visit Scott at MIT. And uh, along with some friends of ours, started talking, really trying to structure what, what is going on in this economy. And, and I came to the conclusion that the bad stuff I was seeing and the good stuff I was seeing were part of the same thing. And, um, and that thing is a massive transformation from one kind of economy to a very different kind of economy. A big transformation, like on the scale of going from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy. And um, the way I would put it is, if, if you think of the 20th century economy, which in the book I call the widget economy, um, it's a blip. It's a weird moment in human history mm. where the main central economic force is rapidly reproducing the same products over and over again. It's How can you make as much money as possible as quickly as possible? By making the same thing over and over again, which means for the very first time in human history, we have massive corporations. You know, you never had an institution like General Motors or Walmart where there are hundreds of thousands, millions of people all work for the same company. And that there's a whole literature on that. That turns out to be a problem. How do you coordinate the activity of all these people who aren't soldiers, they're not priests, they're voluntarily working for a company? How do you direct their action? It turns out the way you direct their action is um, you, have, you create a new thing that had never existed in this way before, a job with a set 
um, salary and set hours and sort of an expectation that if you don't screw up too badly, you know, you'll make more money each year. And, and this idea that we all were born into that seemed just how the world worked, that there's a thing called a job, there's this other brand new thing called a career path, that education is tied into that in some way, as opposed to education being the job of, you know, something obscure for priests or something. And, um, and that there's a safety that we're kind of buffered from the vicissitudes of the market that, you know, your, your, your work does not require that wheat prices be at a certain level or whatever. You're just going to be okay. And that that starts falling apart in, in the 70s and 80s because of trade, because of automation, computer technology, and a lack of government response. And that ripped apart that world and, um, and caused enormous dislocation, but also created enormous opportunity as well. Just like I think of, you know, my great, great, great grandparents were farmers in Plymouth and in the 1890s moved to Worcester, Mass to get a factory job. And that was seen as this horrible fracturing of the family. My family, that part of my family had been in Plymouth since 1620. They never left. And, um, and suddenly the family's broken up, apart. Women are wearing pants living without their parents. Um, it was a disaster. It just felt scary and confusing and painful. And then obviously, eventually, um, we developed an industrial economy that made sense, which is why you're all really jealous to hear I have relatives in Worcester, and you all wish you lived in Worcester. Um, so, um, Are any of your Worcester relatives here right now tonight? That's a long no, way for no them hands. to come okay. to Boston. They're not coming. <laughs> um, I don't think any of them have ever heard of public radio, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, so, um, but that transition was very similar in that sense. It was chaotic, it was scary, it felt like the death of everything sensible and good. But some people early on saw opportunity and eventually there was more opportunity for more people. And, and I do think that it's possible, it, it's not written yet, <laughs> Things could go really badly, but it is possible for us to build an economy that works really well. Okay, so then let's talk about what the passion economy is. Um, what is it? So the idea of the passion economy at, at base is that those very things that ripped apart the widget economy can also be powerful tools to succeed in this new economy. So... Um, it's probably not a headline news that that kind of widget job where you get a job at 18 or 21 or 25 and that's a thing that exists. There's a job that exists and you get that job and you have a sense of a career path and blah, blah, blah. It's, it, it still exists, but it's diminishing and it's less responsible to go for it. But what you can do now, and in, in my argument, for the first time in human history, you can do this at scale, is you can find some something, whether it's a product or a service, that you can uniquely do, that there are not a whole bunch of other people who can You don't do have it. to worry about competition. You yeah, you're a limit, you're just walking away from competition by create by focusing on something that's so unique, so specific to who you are. And you are able to use the internet, global trade, outsourcing logistics, all these modern technologies to find those people spread maybe all over the country, all over the world, who crave what you crave, particularly, who crave the thing you can do. Now, a lot of times when I say this, people, oh, you mean like Etsy? I actually don't really mean like Etsy, because Etsy's, um, I think, a fairly undifferentiated craft marketplace where prices are not particularly good. And I don't think it, you know, I find as a consumer when I go on Etsy, it's not giving me the thing I want the most. Um, it doesn't have to be a thing, it can be services. I write about an accountant who's figured out a, an approach to accounting that is really um, unique to him, but very, very valuable to people who value it. In fact, after writing the book, I hired him, and he's now mine. <laughs> and and 
Um, but he also loves his job. And he loves it. Yeah. And that is a key part of everyone in this book. They love their jobs. There's a fun and excitement when what you're doing is not, you know, if, if you think of what it was like to have a job in the widget economy, you didn't come to work and say, I have all this unique stuff that I'm interested in. I have this weird combination of fascinations. I'd really like to bring that to being an accountant for Sears Roebuck. They'd be like, what are you talking about? Just count the friggin' numbers. <laughs> um, but the people in this book are people who are, you know, it, it's, it's hard to see where work ends and, and family and, 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 and their own passions are. I, I mean, I find that for my own self as a journalist who gets to explore things. I mean, all every night, every <laughs> on the weekends, I'm reading stuff, and I don't know sometimes. Is it, am I reading this because I'm going to do it as use it as a journalist, or is it just fun? And that's the model I keep seeing in in the folks that I s celebrate in the book. So one great example that you have in this book is about, um, and I had never thought about this in my life of the brush industry. So uh, people that make, in this case brushes to clean milk bottles back in the 1840s. 1840s. So there was a company in the widget economy making brushes to clean milk bottles. It became that because it was so successful at doing this. And I guess what the great grandson decided, um, I'm not passionate about this. Let me upgrade this situation and started making brushes through the same company to like clean the surface of Mars so that they can, I mean, tell me more about yeah. the Braun Brush Company, because it's a great example of this. Yeah, I, I love the story of Braun Brush in Long Island. Um, I, I think of this book, I, I call them like true parables, because every story is true, fact-checked, accurate. I did beat up Scott more than necessary, because I had a challenge with Scott, um, which is I specifically didn't want people who had elite pedigrees. I wanted regular folks who were very relatable. I don't like how so many business books, it's like, oh, this person was born to a rich family, went to Harvard, then went to Stanford Business School, and got 10 million in venture capital, and somehow they're really rich now. You know, I, I don't like that. So um, so I, I sought out people who didn't have that kind of pedigree, but Scott's an MIT tenured professor. He's a big shot. And so I spent a lot of time beating him up, probably unfairly in the book, but um, but, but also celebrating him, obviously. So um, so um, Lance Cheney, um, his, yeah, I, I was- No relation to Dick Cheney. That I know of, yes. Um, his great, great grandfather, I think, Emmanuel Braun, was an immigrant from, uh, Germany in the 1840s in Brooklyn, and he had a crappy job cleaning out milk bottles when, you know, there was the milk delivery guy and he'd bring back milk bottles. You can imagine, these are stinky, nasty milk bottles. And he would use these rags and shove his hand in there and, and it was terrible. And he came up with this new brush. Um, where uh, he, he, it, it's a tricky thing. You want bristles that are strong enough to break up the milk, but you don't want the bristles to fall off and get in the milk bottle. And he came up with a very elegant design for a brush to clean um, milk bottles. But it's the 1840s. He basically can sell to people within walking distance. Um, actually, I asked Lance if he had a horse and a cart or he just walked, and Lance said, I think he walked, but I'm not sure. Um, he knows that the business was in a stable, but he thinks there were no horses in the stable. So it was a used stable, an old stable. Anyway, but if you think of that as kind of the economy for all of human history, that um, most material products are made either at home or by a neighbor. You know, you knew the names of the great grandparents of everyone who made everything that you owned. And, it, you know, there's a small amount of luxury goods that would be transported over long distance. But generally, things were nearby. And that creates a certain economics. If I'm a bread maker in medieval France in a village, I might have some brilliant idea for a new kind of bread. But if there's not enough people in that village who want it, I'm not going to transport it all over France to sell it. So I'm just going to make the kind of bread we make in this village very intimate, very local, and not enormous innovation. Emmanuel Braun did have this innovation. He did very well. But again, only in Brooklyn, maybe a bit of Queens. But eventually, over time, the family built the brush business into this huge food brush business, food, focusing on brushes for the food industry. So special brushes for 
pastry shops to rub chocolate on croissants. Um, uh, they, in New York, they got a very popular pizza oven brush. This like were very strong bristles that won't fall off and get in your pizza. And within a generation, it became a widget business where their job was let's make as many brushes as we can, as fast as we can, and sell them to as many people as we can. And they did very well for the whole 20th century. And then, as we so often hear, Chinese companies began exporting similar brushes. You know, China started with fairly broad brushes, like paint brushes, but eventually they get into these more specialized area. And as the story goes, and we've heard the story a million times, at first the brushes were really crappy and the bristles would fall off. And Lance Cheney, our hero's dad, Max, was like, eh, don't worry about China. They're not going to compete with us. And then eventually the Chinese companies get very good. And suddenly, the market is flooded with brushes that finished cost less than the raw materials that the Cheneys needed to pay for. And we hear that story all the time. And it ends with, and then they went out of business. But in this version of the story, Lance said that he had to wait a while. There was a battle with his dad. I mean, they loved each other very much, but his dad just didn't see his ways. But then his dad passed away. And Lance just said, we're done with that. If China makes a brush, we're not going to make that brush which at first is a terrifying thing to do because, of course, the Chinese companies are focused on their biggest sellers. He also said, we're not selling to Walmart. Forget that. I'm, we're never going to win that battle. But Walmart was their biggest customer. And so he decides, what I'm going to do is solve brush-related problems. I'm going to come up with brush solutions. And shockingly, there is a never-ending cascade of brush related solutions. And that's what I love about this story, because if you think about a brush, it's some kind of bristle, some kind of handle, and something to hold them together, glue or staples. or, And that's it, three things. And Lance knows those three things like you can't believe. And his first big solution was for nuclear power plants. He found out that there was this nuclear power plant that had all these staples sloshing around in their cleaning fluid, cleaning water, their water coolant, and coolant water. And, and that's not something you want. It's a bunch of metal parts wandering around your coolant. And he somehow learned that that was because they were using a brush to clean the pipes that had staples, and sometimes the staples would fall off. So he actually used his great or great great grandfather's milk brush solution to create a new version with plastic for power plants, for nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. And the product costs about $12 to make, but he can name any price because, and so he charges $6,000. And <laughs> the nuclear power plant bought some, and then word gets out. He's now selling to many nuclear power plants. and. Um, and then, yes, he also he learned that NASA, the rovers, have to do this procedure where they like dig into rock, but they need to clear a space. Six million dollar brush. Right? Yeah, six million I, I dollar brush. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forget how much he charged for the <laughs> rover one, but he has two uh, brushes on Mars. Very light, very durable. <laughs> and he is, A, thriving. I mean, 20% growth every year for over a decade. And he is having so much fun, it's ridiculous. Even though he does not know today what his best seller in six months is going to be, because he doesn't know what problem he's going to solve. But that is the kind of thing that you see again and again. And this is not some robotics genius from MIT who got venture funding to create the most advanced. This is a guy who takes some nylon, takes some glue, takes some sticks, and solves people's problems and does really well by it. So this brings up another really interesting point in this book, which is about pricing. Um, you say you know, he can charge what he wants for the brush because people will pay for it because they know it's going to be a great brush and it's going to solve their problem. I mean, you lay out the idea in this book that in the passion economy, you should not set your price based on what other people are charging. You need to set your price based on what it's worth and what and people will pay it if it's worth it. And if you're finding the people who want to pay it. So if you think of the Econ 101, Adam Smith, 
supply and demand model where it, it, it presumes indifference. That is the idea. <laughs> the price is the marginal cost, which is also the point where the marginal consumer, the least interested consumer in your product is like, all right, fine. Here's a buck. I'll take your thing. I don't really care about it, but I will. It's worth slightly more than a buck to me. Um, but what is implied in that graph is that there's some people who will pay $10,000 for your thing, and some people pay $5,000 for your thing. And if you think of the Adam Smithian model where the entire market it has complete competition, whatever you're making, someone else can make just as well as you, there's perfect information flow from all people in the marketplace. It, it's, I'm a huge fan of Adam Smith, but he was clearly creating a, a, a theory, a model. He wasn't saying this is how all the world works all the time. Um, what you can do now, though, is really focus on a smaller number of people who desperately want the thing you want, that you make, whether it's a brush or a way of doing accounting or a craft or whatever. You can focus on that population because you can meet them. And um, I think we're still in the early-ish period of the internet, so I think there, there's a lot of still problems about matching buyers and sellers, matching, um, but, but it's already at a point where, uh, where this works, and I think it'll only work better. But if what you're doing is finding those people out there who most crave your thing, then price should reflect the value they put on it, not the value, not the point of indifference, the point of maximum engagement. And again, this is filled with people who do that, Pe uh, people who make farm equipment, people who make clothes, people who make who provide accounting services, a guy who makes ice cream. If, if you're even having a conversation about price, then you're probably talking to the wrong person if they're like, well, how much does it cost? And that's another lesson here is just don't deal with those people. <laughs> deal with people where they're not going to be leading. What if you don't make things for a living? Does the passion economy apply to you? Absolutely. I find as a writer of, on economics, I, I tend towards manufactured goods because it's just easier to write. <laughs> you know, you go to a place, you see them make something, you tell how they made it. It's just easier to write. But, um, you know, something like 12% of the American economy, less than that, is in manufactured goods. And this works, if anything, way better for uh, non-manufactured goods. So accountants, lawyers, I mean, a you know, I think it applies, and I talk about it in the book, to our industry, that, you know, the shift from broadcast radio, which is still valid, Jeremy, <laughs> even if you are stuck in the 20th century, it is still a legitimate choice. Um, for some, not for me, but I wish you luck. Um, but uh, a broadcast media to an on-demand media is a, um, is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. I mean, I... Um, I mean, you and I worked in a lot of the same places, and a point I make, you know, we work in public radio where there's price is not all that relevant, but, you know, I used to be on Morning Edition and All Things Considered all the time, and millions and millions of people hear me, mm -hmm. and I maybe got two emails my whole career, and then I was... You mean from listeners? From listeners, yeah. You um, should see the comment sections these days. These yes, days, yeah, ahead. yeah. But... <laughs> When Planet Money started, I remember when we got to 50,000 listeners, which now would not be exciting. But at the time, podcasting was young. It was amazing. And it was just a constant del deluge of incoming information. And it, you just, just would feel, oh, these people are relating to this thing with an intensity and an engagement that broadcast media doesn't have, except for here and now, which absolutely has it, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think uh, as I was reading this, I mean, you do bring it up a couple of times, but I was thinking to myself, you know, is how much of this came from your own experience in being in broadcast media and then getting into or starting a podcast that has a very engaged but more niche um, audience. Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly the point, that an engaged but niche audience can <laughs> make you happy. Make you happy, but it makes money. I mean, so when I got into public radio, I think you're younger than me, but when you got into public radio, 
there's a dimension to it that it's a bit like the post office. Like you get through a couple hurdles and then you just have a solid job for life. I mean, that's that was sort of the world I came in, that, that um, union job. And, you know, if your, your thought is, okay, if I get to NPR, maybe I can make 100 grand, 120 grand a year if I'm lucky. And that's great. That seemed like a lot of money to me. That seemed great. And then podcasting comes along. And there's lots of people who make podcasts that make no money. But I have many friends, friends who were with me in the like, wow, hopefully one day we can make $120,000 a year, who make millions and millions and millions of dollars even though their audiences are a fraction of the size of the audiences they reached in at NPR, because that engagement just creates a totally different relationship. And this is when we're still only talking about ad-supported podcasts. I, I think the next generation of podcasts, um, where, where it, there will be even, even more so. So yes, I think there's a lot of my own life lessons in this book that I, that I talk about, but I think it is generalizable to many, most industries, a similar pattern. I'm having dinner later tonight with a podcaster, uh, Ben Brock Johnson, who better bring now a really fancy bottle of wine because <laughs> yeah. obviously he's making millions and millions of yes, dollars. Every podcaster is. Yeah. <laughs> Are there people who do not fit into the passion uh, economy? Would a janitor be able to be passionate about their work? I mean, you could definitely easily imagine um, janitorial services fitting in. And, and what I've learned is any industry I look into, I will find people who fit the passion economy. In fact, the way I found Lance Cheney is um, I interviewed a guy who had the more classic model. I interviewed a brush maker who had the more, you know, China competition came, he didn't, he couldn't survive and his business went under. But I caught, there's several brush related industry publications. There's broom and brush, <laughs> or maybe it's brush and mop. I'm not joking, Google them, they're fascinating. And I called the editor of one of them and I sort of explained the concept and he said, oh, Lance Cheney, he's great. You should talk to him. And I have found that with every industry um, that I have looked into, that, that I can quickly find people who fit the model. But I do think a major difference between the 20th century economy and this economy is that the 20th century economy obviously was not perfect, obviously a lot. But if you look at statistics, nearly every demographic group, education, race, background did better over any lengthy period of time. Um, and this economy, I don't think it just rewards, I mean, the, there is the kind of 0.01% inequality, and that's a very real thing. But there's also a kind of top 20% inequality. And um, this was something that Scott and I and, and our friends at MIT and Harvard would come up against, is that we felt there's a really good news story to tell not, not just people who went to Harvard or MIT, but people who went to any college that you've heard of, basically. Like, you know, um, there's, um, and, and people who have a bit of ambition, a bit of curiosity, a bit maybe, not people who are necessarily rich, but have at least enough family support that they can take a little bit of risk. So, you know, a very middle class or even lower middle class um, background is is sufficient, but that that leaves out like eighty percent of Americans, and and I don't know. I'm not saying no one in that bottom eighty percent can can benefit, but it it is harder to see how right now under our current structure they they do benefit. I I, I think um, I think it it's a good news story that there's opportunity for more people to realize it. But it's definitely not a, OK, problem solved. Everything's going to be great. Everyone's better off. I think the 20th century, I had an uncle in Worcester, Mass, who was developmentally disabled. And he was able to work most of his life for a salary. And uh, he, he would push a broom. He, would, he folded um, sheets at a laundry. Um, and then he reached a point where he was unemployable and um, because his skill set was just um, he, he just 
there was nothing, no one in the economy needed him. And I think that number of people is high and serious. And, and that, I don't know that this book, ans that becomes a government policy issue, probably. Who is this book for? I mean, I would say it's for, I mean, frankly, that 20%. It's for people who, um, it is, well, I'd love them to buy it. It is not for the, you know, killer VC funded, I want to become a billionaire person, although they should all buy thousands of copies. <laughs> um, it is for, I mean, frankly, it's for what those people condescendingly and insultingly call lifestyle businesses, uh, meaning a business person who isn't necessarily aiming to grow at all costs, but someone who wants, because um, I think if you want to be a billionaire, if you want to reach that kind of heights, or even if you want to be a hundreds of millionaire, um, you know, you probably do want a big, scaly business that reaches lots and lots of people and makes something that can be rapidly manufactured over and over and over again. The people in this book, I would say, make between like solid six figure to low seven figure incomes, which is really good. And they all, every single person in this book has a nice life. They own a home. They take their family on nice vacations. Um, they're going to be able to retire. They're going to be able to take care of their family. But they're not, I did not want to write a book about people who just want money for money's sake. Why do you think that so many of the books that are out there um, about how to succeed in the economy are about that. How can I make a lot of money really fast? Something that for most people won't happen. I honestly do find it confusing. I've found it confusing for a very long time. Um, that because I mean, if you think of there's well, Scott would know better than me. There's something like 30 million registered companies in America. Maybe four or five million of them actually have employees. Um, there's, you know, whatever, 5,000 big, you know, 3,000 large cap companies. You know, venture funding is fairly stable, as I understand it, 50, 80 million, billion dollars a year, something like that. We're, we're talking about a fringe part of our economy statistically, but it's obviously, it does lead to some shocking growth. Um, but, but if you were an alien who came to Earth and said, like, which group, should we really focus all of our business communications on? I, I don't think you would come up with that model. I, it probably tells us a lot about our society right now that um, so many people want to want to read those books. You know, you. Um, but you know, I don't. I'm not saying this like I'm some kind of hero. There are other books as well. But this was like a discussion with the publisher. This was not, and they were excited about it. But it's writing a book that's like for regular people to have kind of regular sized success is a weird choice to make. And only if each and every one of you buys several copies will this be proven to be. <laughs> um, I want to ask you a few unrelated questions. One is, uh, just given everything that's going on in the world right now, and especially with Iran, uh, you wrote a story in The New Yorker that involves President Trump and uh, and money and Iran. Tell me, like, what what is the? It's complicated, but tell us a little bit about it. It's actually not complicated, and it's a um, although it's a departure from the more optimistic message. I I'll say it bluntly, and then I'll explain why it's true. <laughs> President Trump knowingly participated in what is almost certainly a money laundering front operation under the direction of Qasem Soleimani for the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. And that simple fact has is undisputed. The Trump administration, I mean, the Trump organization says it's true. I have shown it's true. And for the life of me, I don't understand why that isn't mentioned when President Trump says that Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi support terrorists or only he. Now, I don't think Trump loves the Islamic Revolutionary Guard. I can quickly tell you what happened. He, um, around 2009, 2010, I think a lot of the outline of the story is known. You know, he, he had 
lost the ability to, he had long since lost the ability to do what traditional developers do, which is put a small amount of equity down, borrow a lot of money, and build a new structure. Um, he was never very good at it, and he couldn't do that anymore. And he pivoted to this uh, licensing strategy where he would license his name on international projects. Um, he did not focus on markets like London or Paris. He focused on um, hot spots like Baku, Azerbaijan, and um, Panama City, and um, and basically what he what's he he focused on people who could not. This was a time when Four Seasons, Ritz Carlton, Marriott was promoting its new luxury line, JW Marriott, when. If you were a legitimate developer, you had major international partners to help develop your luxury residence or your five-star hotel. So he is dealing with people who are subpar, and he's doing no due diligence whatsoever. So one of his projects that Ivanka led was with the Mamadov family in Azerbaijan. It was... Uh, uh, um, Zia Mamadov was transportation minister of Azerbaijan, we know from WikiLeaks that U.S. cables referred to Zia Mamadov as wildly corrupt, even for Azerbaijan, which is a shockingly corrupt country. And specifically that Zia Mamadov was a partner of a front organization for the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. When the U.S., the EU, and the U.N. put sanctions not on the IRGC itself, but on several of its entities, um, they had a hard time interacting with the global financial system. And so they created a bunch of front companies that um, weren't sanctioned, but were doing the bidding of the IRGC. And one of these, probably maybe the biggest, one of the biggest is something called Azar Pasilo. It was run by two um, IRGC senior officers, the Darvishi brothers, Kamal and Kumars. Um, they were direct deputies of Mohammed Bagar Galabov, who's right now the mayor of Tehran and previously had been in charge of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Air Force, whose job was the missiles um, that would target US bases, Tel Aviv, and specifically to get the missile guidance systems, which is obviously a crucial part of any nuclear missile process. And so Azar Pasilo's primary partner was Zia Mamadov. They had as far as we know, two major corrupt projects, a rail project and a road project. And right when they were when the Mamadovs were doing the Trump Tower, it was a time when we know from other documents and some prosecutions that there was hundreds of millions of dollars that this IRGC operation needed to funnel out. And we also know that the Trump building itself bore all the hallmarks of a money laundering operation. It was... Um, wildly expensive. They built the whole building, then they rebuilt the whole building, then they did all the interiors, then they took them down, redid the interiors. And this is very typical of money laundering because you don't, what you want is a big project where you can be sending hundreds of millions of dollars around the world without, um, and you want there to be a reason for it. But actually, in some cases, you don't want a successful business because a successful business, you can kind of judge, wait, how much money are they making? But an unsuccessful business eventually is wrapped up. No one's really paying attention. And the Mamadovs were pariahs. Obviously, the IRGC was a pariah. But the Trump Organization had enough brand cachet that it was valuable to projects like that. Now, the Trump Organization says they had no idea about any of this until the summer of 2015. But they do say they learned all of this in 2015, and they continued doing the deal until the end of 2016. And so for the entire course, now, first of all, it was easy to find out. A Google search of any of those names would have revealed the whole thing. But let's just assume they didn't learn till the summer of 2015. What that means is for the entire presidential campaign, the Trump Organization knowingly, knowingly was serving as a front for an IRGC money laundering operation. And what we know is the IRGC uses these fronts to fund terror, to acquire weapons of mass destruction. In fact, road building and rail construction projects are exactly the kind of front you want 
when you're acquiring weapons of mass destruction. And none of, none of the general counsel of the Trump Organization told me every fact is true. When I asked, why didn't you cancel the contract when you learned this? He said, hey, you can't just cancel a contract. I was like, I think you probably could, actually, in this case. Um, they had a right in the, I got to see the contract. They had a right in the contract to audit the books of the Mamada family to make sure they were getting, they didn't use that to unravel this scheme. So to me, at a minimum, when we mention the Trump is accusing other people of giving aid and comfort to Qasem Soleimani. The fact that he is literally the only American we know for sure was actually helping Qasem Soleimani with a key strategic priority, I feel like should come up. I told you it was complicated. <laughs> uh, uh, let me just finally ask you um, a couple of questions about, first of all, uh, Planet Money. Where did that idea come from? to start Planet Money, and, and are you happy with where it is now? You're not involved in it anymore. So um, I'll just go back a step. So I, I, uh, I, I actually, my dad left Worcester and um, moved to New York. To, he went to BU and then um, and studied acting and then became an actor. And I grew up in all artist housing in Greenwich Village, New York. And in all artist housing in Greenwich Village in, 19, in the 1970s meant Everything was open, sex and drugs and creative freedom, and we're not going to be like our parents, which means we're just going to say a lot of inappropriate stuff to our children all the time. Um, and and I, in many ways, it was wonderful. In other ways, it's not how I'm raising my son. But, um, but it was just this free, open exploration of the world, except for this one topic, this ugly, horrible topic of money and business. That was some horrible thing that was somehow both evil and boring, and something just evil, boring people cared about. <laughs> and it took me a while, but eventually, as a reporter, I was like, wait, what is that? What's business? Like, I didn't know people with jobs. I didn't know people. Um, I have this memory of being like eight and my dad taking me around Wall Street, and everyone was wearing ties. And I was like, is there a funeral or something? <laughs> because I didn't know people who wore ties, <laughs> except at funerals. Um, but I fell in love with the topic. But I didn't fall, I don't care, I honestly don't care what the stock market did today or, you know, I don't, it's not that I fell in love with how business and finance is covered in an ongoing way, but I learned that bus that's what we care about. It, it affects the quality of our lives on a daily basis. And there's actually real drama and real energy. If you truly understand the Fed, there's amazing, um, intellectual and emotional and historic battles going on, I mean, right now. Um, and, and it's exciting stuff. And, and, and by the way, I would say that every single interview that I do about any election, you always ask what the number one issue is, and it is always the economy. No matter what is going on, it is always, for most people, that is what they're voting on. Exactly. And, and I think that Generally speaking, there's huge exceptions, but the business and financial press really has, to a harmful degree, saw itself as a specialist press. It's kind of like Broom and Brush magazine or something. They don't see themselves as, you know, but I grew up with the New York Times, the business section is the one you throw away because um, you couldn't understand it if you didn't already understand it. And that's not the kind of stuff I wanted to do. And, and so, um, and there were some other people at NPR who, who agreed with me. And so, and, and I would feel like my job as a business reporter was like, okay, go do three minutes on the Fed. And I'm like, I would need 10 minutes just to explain what the Fed is so someone would care that the Fed was or wasn't changing the Fed funds rate. And so luckily I was given that opportunity. And, and really I like to think that what Planet Money did was not dumb things down. We weren't... We were just telling the story as a story, and and that was our rule. Like we want to, I, I feel like sometimes with business coverage, there's a view that it's either substantive or it's engaging, and we're like, let's just be the most of both. Let's just be as engaging and fun and exciting as possible, and as substantive and smart as possible. As for how it's doing now, I have no idea because it's my baby and I've not been able to listen since I left. It's just too, like, I hear it's very good from other people, but um, it's, 
I it was a very specific thing, and I just when I've dipped my toe in, it's just too. It's like I I just can't listen somehow. Um, like it's like David Letterman won't watch the Colbert Report, or the Col or the Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Yeah, it's hard to. A buddy of mine was head writer of Saturday Night Live. He's not watched a single sketch since he left. I just. I don't say this proudly, like I like the people there and I hear good things about it, but just somehow my thumb doesn't go there on the iPhone. By the way, to your point about, about the business press being uh, for a certain group of people, uh, CNBC has the smallest audience, I think, of any of the cable news channels, but the commercials are the most expensive of any of the cable news channels because their tiny audience is CEOs and investors. And I would say CNBC and Fox Business News are the opposite. They're both somehow not engaging and not substantive. <laughs> like it's, it's like to me, it's like someone who actually cares and knows about the economy. They're like sucking away knowledge and intelligence. <laughs> uh, let me just finally ask you, and then we'll uh, take some questions from the audience. Um, you're now in the print world. How do you like that compared to broadcasting? Um, it's funny. I, I, I mean, my whole career, I've kind of bounced back and forth, although probably more radio than print. Um, I, um, I see huge advantage. I, I see them as wildly different and, um, and just the whole experience of doing it is different. Um, I, I do think I prefer, dare I say it, print. I do prefer print. Um, but uh, I feel like I can control it more. <laughs> like with radio, there's this agonizing thing that you just need someone to say the thing in a good way. And you can edit them and you can change it. But it's like you're, you're in the hands of the people you interview. <laughs> and with print, you can... The, you, you, you can do more of it yourself. You can do more of it yourself if you don't get quite the right quotes. So I just find it easier um, in the not easier on a like it's hard to write well and you know but it's not I'm not saying I write so well but but it's hard to like it's a struggle. I'm not saying it's easy but yeah I think I, I but um, I like but I, I also run a podcast company so I like audio. Too, but, but I like being the boss of other people who have to get the interviews. Then, <laughs> okay, let's uh, take any questions that you might have. Um, the microphone is right over here, so just if you raise your hand, here we go. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, how do you think the idea of the passion economy relates to maybe entrepreneurship pedagogy that stresses maybe? not getting blinded by your own passions, but trying to understand other people's problems. It sounded to me kind of like Lance Cheney was, his passion was solving other people's problems. Did you find that a lot with the people you interviewed for this? Yes, absolutely. And I, I would say both are crucial. Like you, you need, for me, the process of finding your passion is, um, it's not, it's not just sufficient to find like, oh, I really love whatever it is. It's, it's the, it, first of all, I don't think we're all born with a particular passion and it's just fully formed. I mean, it can take years and, you know, and it's worth taking years to figure out the way that your passion can manifest. But, but the essential thing is matching it with an audience that's actually willing to pay money for it. You know, I, um, my mom ran a, modern dance project that was bringing modern dance to underserved communities. And I said to my mom, that doesn't exist. Everyone is getting exactly as much modern dance as they want. There's, <laughs> there's no underserved community for modern dance. And, um, and I think that, you know, wrong, incorrectly done, the passion economy can be self-indulgent and, and unsuccessful. Now, Probably if you're spending a fortune and going to MIT or Harvard Business School and you really want to have a venture back, you want to have investors and you want to grow dramatically, you know, you probably should be aware of what unique value you bring, but maybe you do have to put more emphasis on the customer. And you and if so so 
I, I understand why, but, but I think even in that context, you do want to know, like, wait, what are the things I can uniquely do, which might not be the, the product or service might not be the passion. Like Jason Blummer, the accountant, he probably wishes he never was an accountant. It's just when he realized he wanted to run a passion business, he was a successful, experienced accountant. So he did it through accountancy. Um, so, but the, the specific, and that's something I kept learning from the people in this book, that the specific manifestation might not be where the passion is. The passion is in that relationship. It's in the process of problem solving. In fact, Lance Cheney, he went into the business because his dad was in the business. He didn't care about brushes. But then when he unlocked this, it was through brushes. But I would say his real passion is that problem solving, that creative problem solving. Hi. So uh, I, I have two different reactions to this, and I want you to comment on both of them. Okay. One of them is 20%, um, that's not regular people, right? That's a pretty elite bunch if it's only 20% who, who can do it. Um, but maybe, uh, and okay, so, here's, so here are the two things. One of them is, um, if 20% are starting businesses that are their passions, and they do need other people to work for them, okay, then this growing inequality problem we have isn't really going to go away. It's just going to be that maybe there are a few more who are closer to the top, okay? Um, the second thing, the second possibility is that um, that it's not really 20%, that it's a set of people who really, who know a lot of other people, who like to interact with other people, who like to solve problems. You might have people who are not, you know, that, not even wealthy enough to take those kinds of risks. Maybe there are, some of them are so poor that taking a risk is, or not taking a risk are the same thing to them, right? Um, but they know enough and can learn enough about the other people around them and to make connections between what they know and or what they can do and what other people want to get something started that doesn't make a lot of money but makes some money and leaves them better off than they were. Um. So two things. One is I was actually quite tortured by this thing that, wait, is this just for 20 percent? And is it even for all that 20 percent? Maybe it's for 5 percent of the 20 percent. And and actually, when we were doing this work at MIT and Harvard, that was something that we really were struck by, is the idea that there just are different answers for different segments of the population. And at the end of the day, you know, it's one book. It's not, you know, I... I had to be comfortable with the fact that I'm not solving all of America's problems with my one book, and that um, if books can change any lives at all, I don't know if they can. Um, you know, I do feel like I meet a lot of people where I think, boy, these lessons would make your life better, and um, and so I decided I was okay with that. You know, especially given that so much of my career has covered um, some of the other issues. Um, I, I do think personally that this new economy requires a much stronger social safety net. It requires us recognizing that this economy is going to leave some huge, not, not small amount of people out, and that business is probably not going to solve those problems, and certainly entrepreneurship is not going to solve those problems. And to me, I'm very comfortable with um, a much stronger social safety net. Um, it doesn't feel like we're on the brink of that, but, um, but I, I do think that even if I didn't care about other people just for the safety of my own family, our economy, our country will be less safe if lots of people recognize that they can't benefit in this economy. So that I think those are very real issues. Um, but the last point I will come in really strong and say this is not about wealth. I mean, many, most, all, almost everyone in this book had essentially no money to start with. Um, what they did have, which is very valuable, is they existed in a social context where they had family, they had other people. They knew that if things got bad, you know, they, they'd have a couch to sleep on or someone to help 
help them lick their wounds and 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 improve. But I I went out of my way. There there were I mean maybe a couple people in the book started their journey in a position of wealth, but the vast majority did not. And and I don't I do think that um, that you can do this from a very lower income base. I don't I think if you're all on your own and you have no money at all and you're working two shifts a day just to pay rent, then yeah, you probably there's not much I, I can offer. But but I think a much larger number of people than currently are benefiting can benefit. I, I do believe that. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Really enjoy it. Hey, just curious and, and there may not be uh, an example here, but any stories that you uh, uh, didn't make it into the book that are on the cutting room floor? There's a ton of them, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really have a big collection. And in fact, I did a podcast for um, last year on a subscription service that not a lot of people listen to. So I'm going to relaunch it in March, I think, uh, more broadly. That That is... Uh, I think we had 36 interviews. Um, but yeah, I mean, it. in the beginning, it felt like I was finding this like precious resource that barely existed. And then after a while, I realized, once I knew how to ask the question, if I asked anyone knowledgeable, and I bet if I sat with, with many of you and talked about your field, you, oh, right, I know, yeah, oh, yeah, this person, oh, this person. And, and so, um, like, for the podcast, we're now booking guests for the next season, and it's the easiest thing in the world. They're all around us. Could you talk a little bit more about the pricing piece? Because it seems to me that maybe we're in a sweet spot right now where not as many people are in, you know, are performing their passions, but use the example of podcasts. So right now, so many of them are ad driven. I think, okay, I might pay for my first four podcasts, but at some point I can't pay for the 12 podcasts that I'm really passionate about. And then if that multiplies to other things that I'm getting for free or, you know, in a discounted model now or in a widget model, how much um, elasticity is there for people to pay for all of their passions at a premium rate? So th this, I actually believe there is a lot more space for us to pay for a lot more. <laughs> so if, if you just think of the things you consume in your life, your, your clothes, your devices, your furniture, your food... Um, your hair care products. Obviously, Jeremy and I spent a lot of money on hair care. Um, not to mention stuff that might help you in your work, education, what you read, what you consume, entertainment that you consume. I would say, I would bet if we did an audit of your life, we would find that you're spending a lot of money on things you just don't care that much about. And that there might be things that would give you far more satisfaction at, um, and the price would not be wildly different. Um, and, and I do think that the trends that I talked about are, mean we are heading in that direction. Now, it, um, it, it's easiest to see in kind of wealthier consumption, like, um, you know, you go to Whole Foods and, you know, it used to be all the soaps were from two companies and just were different brand names for the same three chemicals. And now there's real actual difference in soaps. I, that's actually one chapter I didn't put in. I had a whole thing on soaps. And um, chocolates are wildly different. You know, if, if, um, ivory soap used to be a third of soap. I think it got up close to 50% of soap. Ivory soap sucks. I grew up with ivory soap. It dries out your skin. It's now single digit percent of soap consumption. So I, I think we have a major matching problem. It's like a math problem, a, a computer problem. How do, how do you get the things you want without being overwhelmed with noise of crap you don't want? And then how do you figure out that price and how is that price the right price? Um, but I, I don't see it as, oh, you're suddenly going to have to spend five times more money on all your consumables. You know, we spend a tiny, tiny percentage of our income on our basic necessities compared to our great-grandparents who spent, you know, whatever it was, a third on food, a third on clothes. So um, 
So that's one I feel very optimistic about. And actually, if you talk to people in consumer packaged goods, the big companies that make this stuff, they all will point you to India and Africa at what they call the bottom of the pyramid as the place of the most innovation, the most new, not just products, but ways of selling products and packaging and distribution. So, so that's an area I, I feel like we will all continue to just the amount of stuff we're interacting with that for us will just grow and grow and grow. Thanks very much, Adam. It's been very interesting. Um, I wondered if you found that there were any common characteristics like personality types or and or <laughs> skills um, amongst this particular group of people. So for example, I could imagine that they might all have been really good communicators or have been very um, investigative as a personality trait. Yeah, I, I've thought a lot about that because it is a very different group in a lot of ways. There's evangelical Christians, there's an ex-Catholic priest, Scott is, can we call you godless? Um, <laughs> um, there's, um, I, I would say there is this um, inquisitiveness, partnered with a lack of uh, willingness to settle, I would say, that um, th th these were not people who were like rule, like, oh, no, this is the way it is, and this is the way it'll always be. So that, because some are introverted, some are extroverted, some are, um, you know, so, so I, but I, I would say it's that inquisitiveness. I'll say my son is like wildly, you know, he's just, he's eight. Maybe all eight-year-olds are like this, but he's just wildly curious and wildly, um, like, just everything. Wait, why this and why this and why this? And and I'm like, that's that's the key to the 21st century. Like, more than intelligence, more than anything else. That feels like that. That's the, that's the core. I'll also say though, I was surprised. I'm a secular Jew, you know. And not religion isn't a big part of my world, um, but. I was surprised how many religious people there were, and, and I wondered about that. And I just, I came to admire that religion was a tool to make people at least have a moment in their week where they thought, wait, what's my higher purpose? What's, what's more than just work? What, what do I want? What, what is going to be my legacy? And, and so that, too, I, I would say, is a dimension. Like, I tell the story of this guy who makes ice cream. And... He's not religious at all, but the way he talks about making the perfect chocolate, the perfect vanilla, it's, you could never find a religious figure who talks as devotedly and is <laughs> like, he is going to give children the perfect ice cream experience. And it's with that kind of devotion that really matters. Um, I have a chapter on the Amish, and I remember talking to an Amish woman who said, you think we're simple, because you think we just turn everything away, but that's not true. We think about everything. Every time there's a new technology, we talk about it. We decide, is it good for us or not? You're simple. You just do whatever <laughs> comes along. And I, I feel like that lesson is, is a lesson that, that I get from these folks. Uh, we have time, I think, for one more question. So who shall it be? Oh my gosh, the pressure. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Adam. Thank you again for coming. This has been really interesting. Um, so I'm a business owner, and I get messages daily um, it's an online business. I get messages daily from influencers. Do you think they fall into the passion economy or are they just looking to make a few bucks? What do you think? I, I think that um, having an eight-year-old son who, when he's allowed to watch, watches YouTube videos <laughs> with these influencers and it's very confusing for his dad and mom. Um, I do think that there are several of them who fully embody this, that they have figured out a form of storytelling and a type of story that they want to tell, um, and they are communicating it very well. And they are creating genuine and deep engagement with another group of people. Um, I also think that there's a lot in the this kind of social media world that is I would call more commoditized or more like you can kind of grab a hold of a trend real quick, make a few bucks, but I don't know that you're making real engagement over the long haul 
where um, those followers will follow you um, where you go next. Um, so I guess the answer is both. One thing I did want to mention, I keep pointing at Scott because he was so central to my thinking. And Scott, when when is your book? Um, he's going to, so if my book is the sort of first easy read into this, Scott's going to have a much more substantive how to apply many of these same lessons. Um, this year from Norton. This year from Norton by Scott Stern and Joshua Gans. And Aaron Scott. And Aaron Scott. Yes. Um, so, uh, and what's it called? Entrepreneurship, a strategic approach. Entrepreneurship, a strategic approach. And, and seriously, I do think of that. I, I don't want to say all your ideas are the same, but, but that would be this book applied. So I just, since he's here, I want you all to write that note down. Okay, <laughs> we have to give everybody time to go and buy your book and get it signed and then go watch the debate, which starts at nine o'clock tonight. Okay. Um, but I, I do want to say one thing, just as it came to my mind thinking about the passion economy, the best piece of tape that I think I've ever gotten in my life was many years ago, and I was doing this project uh, where I would go around and interview people about whatever they wanted to talk about. And I found a lot of people that had very interesting different jobs. And I met this guy sitting on a park bench in West Tisbury, Massachusetts on Martha's Vineyard. And I was like, what do, you, what do you do? And he goes, well, I used to be the keeper of the clock tower here at the Congregational Church. And I said, oh, really? And I looked at my watch, and it, it was like, you know, 157. I was like, is the bell about to go off? Because it'd be great to get some sound of the bell going off. He goes, yeah, it's going to go off at 2 o'clock. Do you want me to take you up there? And I was like, yeah, great. And so we go up there. It's this incredible machinery up in the top of this clock tower. And it, it, I get this great sound. And he starts to get, he starts to remember. He hasn't been up there in a few years. And he starts to remember what it was like. And he goes, I guess my ultimate reason for retiring is that I don't really care what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> that aired for a long time. All right. Anyway, Adam Davidson, thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. That was awesome. Thank you all. Thank you.